Thank you, Noreen. And thank you, certainly, David Reba Williams. When I was a teenager in California, I had three posters in my bedroom. Bob Dylan, E.E. E. Cummings, and Thomas Hardy. <laughs> now I tell you this not so you can determine what a troubled adolescent I was, but I tell you this because I have been devoted to this writer and this work from a very young age. The first time I heard Hardy's poems, I fell in love with him as a poet. And a lot of people still say, oh, I didn't know Hardy wrote poetry. Well, indeed, he did. However, making this evening uh, lighthearted, <coughs> comical, humorous, it's impossible. <laughs> so I'm glad I got one laugh out of you because there may not be any more. <laughs> Hardy said, for every bad, there is a worse. <laughs> it also reminds me of uh, a lady who was complimented on her elegant and very somber black dress, and she replied, I'll wear black until something darker comes along. <laughs> But Hardy particularly serves the purpose of this series because he is not only an astonishing novelist, writer of prose, but he is one of our greatest poets. And he serves the series even more because he made a very determined division between the two genres. Hardy lived 88 years. His dates, I will give you, 1840 to 1928. And he was prolific. We have 13 novels, many of them great, over a thousand poems, a verse play, The Dinas. He pronounced it that way, by the way. And many letters. He wrote a few poems in his younger years, but then he really pretty much abandoned poetry and went ahead with the prose, with the novels. Then at the age of 57, after the publication of Jude the Obscure, which will be our prose focus this evening, Hardy abandoned prose writing. He couldn't take it anymore. He was tired of the harsh criticism which of course always comes to a revolutionary and somebody ahead of their times. He also took criticism strangely, a very personally, which, which you might see in his letters. But here he was, successful, celebrated, wealthy, and despondent. So he also was tired of censorship. And he just said, it's over. That's my last novel. I am now turning my attention to poetry. So he did that, and in one of his letters, he said to his friend Arthur Benson, it's natural for me to write poetry. I never intended to be a prose writer. Still less a teller of tales. Still, one has got to live. So he implies here that all these great novels were really not that intentional and really done for survival's sake. I'm not so sure of that, but another biographer, Claire Tomlinson, also attributes his writing of poetry and his inspiration, uh, those great love poems and those elegies uh, that are so famous, came, of course, after the death of his first wife, Emma. And that gave a particular focus to Hardy, and he continued with those poems much to the indignation of his second wife, Florence, uh, because he was writing them with quite a passion and a lot of remembrance of his romance with Emma. We're going to begin with poems tonight. We're going to hear three poems, all using the metaphor of birds. And the bird has always been an obvious symbol of poetry. We have durability combined with frailty. We have, of course, color and we have flight, mobility, and song. So in this look at the birds, um, we also are going to find this metaphor later in Jude the Obscure. 
but I want to say a few more notes about these poems um, about the birds. Hardy was a devoted animal rights advocate. He, was, he put this in poems, he put this in his prose, and he was also politically active. He was very concerned about the plight of animals and birds, and the first poem is entitled The Blinded Bird. I told you this would be a laugh riot, so there we go. That's the first poem. But it is about this very strange tradition, Flemish and Dutch, called Wichtensport, in which a male finch is either blinded or put in a box so that he cannot see, and the amount of mating calls it gives out in an hour are counted. This goes on today. There are many people practicing this, and there are many animal rights advocates, as Hardy was, against it. Who knew? Uh, the puzzled game bird speaks for itself. And then we have the darkling thrush, one of Hardy's most famous poems, which was first titled The Century's End, 1900. So one of the finest voices in theater, film, and definitely for poetry, Edward Herman. The Blinded Bird. So zestfully canst thou sing, and all this indignity with God's consent on thee, blinded ere yet a wing by the red hot needle thou, I stand and wonder how so zestfully thou canst sing. Resenting not such wrong, thy grievous pain forgot, eternal dark thy lot, groping thy whole life long, after that stab of fire, and jailed in pitiless wire, resenting not such wrong. Who hath charity? This bird. Who suffereth long and is kind, is not provoked, though blind, and alive and sepulchred. Who hopeth, endureth all things, who thinketh no evil, but sings. Who is divine, this bird? The puzzled game birds. I live in Salisbury, Connecticut, and I drive from Sharon up to Salisbury, and I pass a farm where they raise pheasants. voice of the pheasant. They are not those who used to feed us when we were young. They cannot be. These shapes that now be bereave and bleed us, they are not those who used to feed us. For did we then cry, they would heed us. If hearts can house such treachery, they are not those who used to feed us when we were young. They cannot be. The darkling thrush. I leant upon a coppice gate when frost was spectre gray, and winter's dregs made desolate the weakening eye of day. The tangled bind stems scored the sky like strings of broken lyres, and all mankind that haunted nigh had sought their household fires. The land's sharp feature seemed to be the century's corpse outlent. His crypt, the cloudy canopy, the wind, his death lament. The ancient pulse of germ and birth had shrunken hard and dry, and every spirit upon earth seemed fervorless as I. At once, a voice arose among the bleak twigs overhead, in a full-hearted evensong, joy illimited. An aged thrush, frail, gaunt, and small, in blast beruffled plume, had chosen thus to fling his soul upon the growing gloom. So little cause for carolings of such ecstatic sound was written on terrestrial things, afar or near around, that I could think there trembled through his happy goodnight air some blessed hope whereof he knew, and I was unaware.
will now turn to prose, to Jude the Obscure. The book was published in 1895, and a few reminders of the year. 1895, Queen Victoria is still alive. Oscar Wilde is on trial, and Darwin certainly has been, uh, the theories have been around for about 30 years, but they are still quite controversial, oh, yeah, and I indeed, Hardy is interested in them. He wants to demonstrate characters that have survival skills and some that do not. We call them skills now, I'm not sure he would have done that. Some of the themes in Jude the Obscure, um, I, I want to kind of uh, make a list for you, but the umbrella theme, the theme under which I think all the others can fit, is fate. Fate over and over again. Jude is an autodidact. He's a very rigorous self-learner. And he does everything he can for scholastic self-improvement. But he is not allowed academic opportunity, and his destiny is never to enter and succeed at the university. That is his fate. The married in the book, and there are two couples. Their fate is to marry the wrong person, to not let the initial, um, let's say, happiness in any way uh, survive its longevity. So consequences of marriage is another fate. Social status and class. Can it be, can one lift oneself out of whatever class or status one was born to? In this book, no. In Hardy's opinion, which is stated in the book, it takes three generations. <clears throat> Although Hardy himself did it in one. The pious fate again. The church betrays them as do its moral precepts. And then finally and most profoundly, what happens to the fate of children? What happens to their innocence as they grow up? Well, fate has it that their innocence is, of course, destroyed, as it must be. The book was criticized extremely in its day for its frank treatment of sex. It was sometimes referred to as Jude the Obscene. And like Hardy's poems and novels, the book is set in his imaginary landscape, which he, he meticulously did a geography of an area called Wessex, which comes out of his mind, though it is based uh, somewhat loosely on his childhood in, in Dorchester. So Wessex also became uh, an attack that was frequently brought on this book. People were upset that he attacked marriage. They were upset that he attacked the church. Bo uh, booksellers often sold the book in brown paper wrappers. I can only think that would help sales. But. <laughs> The Bishop of Wakefield was reputed to have burned his copy and sermonized against it, and then ironically, some critics said the book was too full of Hardy's sermons. Emma Hardy, and this is where it comes home, Emma Hardy was upset about the book. Her upset was that she feared people would think it was autobiographical. So he had it at home, he had it in the outside, and this great novel is the reason he turned, as I said earlier, to poetry. In brief, the novel tells the story of Jude Foley. Jude is a stonemason. He lives in southwest Wessex. He yearns to be a scholar at Christminster, which is a city loosely modeled after Oxford. He tirelessly studies and learns Greek and Latin. The chapter we are, we are starting with begins early in the book, Jude is a boy. He is working at his aunt's bakery, and he has another job of hauling a clacker around to fields to scare away the birds, note the metaphor, 
uh, so that they do not eat the seeds and crops. And as you know, that's pretty much two small boards that can be swung or twirled to make a noise. And we do not have a clacker, but I think you're going to read it without one, right? 